Hello everyone, my name is Duncan Bruce. I'm the alumni manager at the National Film and Television School. And this is NFTS Backstory, which is done in association with the BFI. And tonight we're joined by composer David Arnold, whose work is very vast from Stargate and Independence Day to James Bond, to his work on TV shows like Sherlock uh, and other, other major productions. Um, and he'll be interviewed by Steve Burnham, who's the NFTS's production accountant and also an alumnus of the NFTS. So I'm going to drop out and hand over to Steve. But if you want to ask questions, we'll be asking David your questions at the end. And you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to ask questions throughout. But from now, I will hand over to Steve. Today. Thank you, Duncan. Hello, everybody. Uh, I, of course, Duncan, you forget to mention he's produced albums with Shirley Bassey and uh, Bond. I thought I'd leave you some room to. And theatre and a little thing called James Bond, which I have to admit, I'm being a little bit of an anorak. So brace yourself. But David, welcome. It's a real pleasure to, to welcome you here and in front of this audience as well. Welcome. It's a, what a fun way to spend the evening. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, first, it's interesting first, first, having one's body, having one's body of work described as very vast. I mean, it's <laughs> like, I'm not sure how many different types of vast you can get, but yeah, <laughs> very vast is obviously hugely vast. Well, I'm going to take you back to to last week. Of course, you were celebrating the 150th yeah. anniversary of the of the Royal Albert Hall, and is is the preparation for an event like that? Was that how you spent your COVID lockdown period? And and how was it to write for a live experience again? Uh, well, A, the answer is basically yes. Lockdown was writing that gig. Um, it wasn't writing it very quickly. Um, if I had to have done it quickly, I would have done it. But it's one of those awful things that my, my first, uh, Jeff Foster, who's an engineer who I work with a lot, um, he says there's no point any composer doing any work before three weeks before your delivery date because everything gets done in the last three weeks so don't worry about it up till then so i mean the problem is you get to that point where you think like it's far enough for me enough away for me not to really worry about it that much and when covid happened it moved quite a long way away so it's like oh this is good i'll be able to spend ages now but of course you don't you know you end up sort of doing the same thing but just in little dribbles here and there well, I do anyway. I'm terribly, I, I like not working. I like not doing anything. I like watching films. I love watching films. I like doing nothing because when you're doing something, it's to the exclusion of all else. So when I'm not doing anything, I like doing the all else as well. Um, and so we started off before lockdown. We'd, we'd done about 25 um, workshops. Now, I know Alexi Sale's got a thing about hating the use of the word workshop when you're talking about the arts because he thinks it should just be about welding but they're technically uh workshops we went into like schools and sheltered housing associations and chelsea pensioners and all sorts of different sort of social groups that are dotted around the sort of tri barrier area around the hall who benefit from its uh um charitable outreach program and uh, like instrument tuition and visiting groups and coming to the hall and performing at the hall. So the idea was not to pay lip service to community involvement, but actually get them actively involved. So I went round with um, uh, a guy called um, uh, James Moriarty, weirdly, um, who wasn't evil. Uh, he was very... <laughs> a very good facilitator and workshop sort of supervisor. So he's very much, I don't know what you do with a workshop. Anyway, I learned from him uh, and it was engaging people and involving people in, in the idea of music. And I was then like a conversationalist about why the hall meant something to them or what it did mean if it meant anything at all. And trying to, to, to ultimately to try and represent their stories and their ideas and their emotions in the music so it wasn't going to be directly lifting something that someone said or an idea that someone had but it was to put all this stuff in a giant kind of mental percolator and as it come out you know over the months um each of these chapters um would be hopefully representative of something important 
and I've never written concept music before so I was slightly nervous of why they'd asked me to do it um because you know I'm not Harrison Burtwist or I'm not any you know film music you tend to write in a in a in a line you know which moves in in like by clock uh and you tend to work from left to right and you don't always get the opportunity to write from top to bottom or from front to back a lot of the time it's about finding something which is going to generate something else that's not in the picture that needs to be generated whether that's excitement or emotion or or trickery or sleight of hand um it's illuminating something that needs to be illuminated uh and that has to happen quickly so it's not the sort of thing like with 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 concert music where it's designed to be uh in a way absorbed in a very different fashion and appreciated in a different fashion and understood in a different fashion you know film music is a part of a lot of other things um but one of the tricks of film music i suppose is to get your message across quickly is to establish the mood quickly to say what you need to say quickly the beauty of classical music and concert pieces is that you don't have to get to the point till the very end but the point can be incredibly profound when you get there because of the journey that you take so i thought well i'm not a concert composer i don't really write like that and i thought well should i and then i thought well why should i because they haven't asked a concert composer to do it they've asked a film composer to do it so maybe they want me to do what i do normally or maybe best i don't know uh, and it came out somewhere between the two um i kind of chapterized the evening they wanted 75 minutes of music um and i went into the uh archives and spent a lot of time looking at all the things that have happened in the hall over its 150 years and there's been a lot of things there've been over over 34,000 individual events in the hall uh and everything from so sport science political movements remembrance services uh so many so many things have happened um i thought well i can't write about all of these things in one big sort of blob so let's chapterize it so the things that could be conceived as science based came under the headline of science so you're boxing and your table tennis and your your indoor marathon uh and uh, uh wrestling and ice skating and badminton and ping pong uh all went under sport and so on and so on and so i wrote 10 6 or 7 minute pieces um with the hopefully the sense of those things happening in the music uh, and that happened eventually last last monday so yeah just the, just the, uh, over a week ago it's funny you and it was that. astonishing it was an astonishing thing because we had I mean, we had the resources are obviously quite it's quite rare to be able to have uh because of the cost obviously to have a you know full symphonic uh orchestra and a uh, hundred choir and you know the the projection work we made films for each piece uh so it was a proper audio visual kind of combination and the lighting systems and the sound obviously it's a hugely expensive thing to put on so it's rare that you are allowed to play in that sand pit you know very rare fantastic um it's, it's interesting but it was fantastic to be able to um establishing music very early into a film um i i read i've read several interviews of yourself where of course you you mentioned as a child in in luton that three films had a particular effect and of course you know twice is the one obviously was the biggest irony you end on to be a mm. bond composer the jungle book and oliver that there are three films which pretty much from the opening bars are music and it was that something as a, as a child you picked up very early and from watching those kind of films um not that it was predestined to be a composer but did you start to play with music did you start to collect soundtracks and listen to various styles well i mean we didn't really have money for that but i'll tell you what there was i mean obviously there wasn't dvd there wasn't uh video there wasn't uh films on tv were rare you know there were two channels that were on when i was growing up i mean it's it's so weird to be talking about it now considering where we are now and uh, you know 
it's not that long ago, but it's far enough. I mean, for me, it feels like yesterday, obviously, but it's weird to think that in my childhood, there was only BBC and ITV and that was it. And it was black and white and it went off at 10 o'clock at night with the national anthem. And it started at five o'clock in the afternoon with the kids programs. You know, that's all there was. Uh, and radio. So radio was much bigger because it was free and it's on all the time. And my mum and dad had um, lots of, uh, well, my dad was sort of, he was partially sort of the popular classical music. He had a lot of that. Uh, they had a lot of um, uh, musical, theatrical musical soundtracks. The big ones, there was like Cabaret, South Pacific, um, uh, um, uh, Oliver, uh, um, you know, all the big American ones. Um, so listen to those. My mum had a couple of Beatles albums, but most of the time there was always music on in the house. So that's what I remember more than anything is that there was music on all the time. I mean, to get us up in the morning, my dad would put the radio at the bottom of the stairs and just turn it up loud. So there would always be songs, always song. Uh, and my dad, who was a boxer, but then started singing, um, had a massive suitcase full of uh, sheet music, uh, which in those days was obviously printed sheet music with uh, what you would now get guitar chords on were then sort of ukulele banjo chords because they were to be comping in a kind of jazz band, dance band setup. Um, and uh, so I used to listen to him singing those, hear those songs on the radio, because in the 60s, of course, you'd be hearing music from the... 50s and 60s so popular music had only really just found somewhere in the 60s you know it didn't really exist much before that um so you had the sort of classic songwriters um from the musicals or jerome kern uh uh, uh and you know the the, the guys who wrote the great american songbook uh, and our british writers as well so that was primarily what was on the radio at that point until the beatles turned up and everything changed um so there was a lot of songs and i think that's why i think i'm a i'm a huge fan of songs probably above all else so when the jungle book came on and oliver came on and you only live twice came on there's sort of three things happened these are all extraordinary visual films very striking very individualistic cinematography spectacular casting spectacular quality of songs and performance spectacular oliver you had the uh, the you know choreographic element of it which was astonishing um and all of them hugely identifiable huge strong song backbone whether it's the bond theme alongside you only live twice as a theme alongside um you know the rest of john's work in that you know the, the space march capsule in space um you know very identifiable idiosyncratic pieces a jungle book obviously full of great songs and oliver everyone's a winner um so each one of these kind of knocks you sideways a little bit and i thought all films were like this you know i thought they were all amazing and don't forget this was in a cinema where you were being with like a thousand people they weren't the tiny little cinemas that they are now so it's a communal experience and these things you would not see on the telly for seven or eight years after they came out in the cinema. So when you went, it felt like a real event. It felt like a real event. It was a special thing when you went to see these big movies. I used to go to Saturday morning TV uh, cinema as well, where you get on the bus, go down to the Odeon, and there'd be two films, usually a children's film foundation film where someone lost a rabbit in Trafalgar Square or something. Uh, and then there'd be some uh, Flash Gordon, black and white Flash Gordon. Uh, and then you'd get the main film, which, if you were lucky, was might be an old Disney one, like Pete's Dragon or something like that. Uh, if you weren't lucky, it was a, some British thing, again, about someone losing a rabbit somewhere else, you know. Or there's a toy got left on a bus, you know, and then an hour and a half, someone finds it, that sort of thing. Um, and um, so these things are incredibly exotic. And Bond especially, you know, my bedroom overlooked the Electrolux car park, right? Electrolux was a company that made fridges and, and, and uh, vacuum cleaners. Uh, and so every day I'd see four or 5,000 people arriving in this car park and by my front of the house and at the back of the house on bikes and walking, and throngs of people 
going into work at a factory. Uh, and then at five o'clock, they'd all come out again. And that was what it was like day after day after day. All of a sudden I'm watching a Bond movie and they're in Japan and they're going up a volcano. And it's like a travelogue, you know, because you didn't have travel shows, really. I mean, there's Alan Wicker, but they were on at 8.30 at night. So if you were a kid, you didn't see them. So you didn't really see much of the world. And all of a sudden, Bond kind of opened that up. But as an eight-year-old boy watching You Only Live Twice, you know, the thing starts with the gun barrel, which is a thrill in itself. Um, and then you open up on that spaceship just silently. I've never seen anything like this in my life. You know, and it was a model, not CGI, so you knew it was real. And kids can really tell the difference between, you know, CGI and models. Models are terrifying. CGI, they know it's not real. It's just a thing. Even now, they know it's not real. Uh, so this little spaceship comes along, and then this big one comes up, and he gobbles it up. And then there's one guy who's in a spacesuit, and he gets his, his, his rope gets cut, and he floats off into infinity and obviously dies. Then you have that song, those that's violins you have that song that amazing song and in the next scene you get sean connery post coitly being machine gunned to death and then dumped over the side of a military uh uh you know seafaring vessel with a full funeral in order for him to be rescued by m in a submarine underneath and of course he takes the he's got a suit on and he's been breathing through his rebreather and you know all this stuff and I go, like, this is just amazing. I was eight Close and I was from mind. Luton. And I go, like, of course, <laughs> of course I'm going to want to have some of that. Well, it was, it I was... think the overall thing with all, with all of those three films was, sorry, uh, the, uh, but the overall thing was that the, 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 the sheer excitement of feeling what I felt when I watched those films was something that I desperately wanted to be a part of. You know, I thought, I want to be a part of the thing that makes me feel like this. Because their grown-ups have done this, you know, they're doing it for a job. How can you do that? And when you're from Luton and your dad works in a factory and your mum is just like a stay-at-home mum, you've got no clue, you know. It's Ooh, like man. there is no yeah. way of knowing that journey. So then it was a very long journey from wanting to to doing. So, I mean... It's going to sound like an A-level question, actually, but music as a, as a means of storytelling. Um, it's almost like a cliche, but I wonder if we could have your explanation of that, what music adds to a story. Well, I mean, if it's part of a film, it's inherently part of a storytelling device. So it depends if we're talking about it outside or inside the sort of structure of a film or a play, in which case it has a place and it has a position and it's almost, there is almost a diktat within the drama that says we need music here. Like you would make a film like we need camera movement here. We need, we need a huge lighting change here. We need an effect here. We need to hear something here in order for the story to evolve and happen in front of us. So music in its essence, as part of a film, is going to have a storytelling responsibility anyway. Outside of it, um, and I don't know if that's what you mean. I don't know if we're going to stick with the film thing because obviously... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm going to go a little further. <laughs> a little, little point talking about days, other things. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it's one, of the, one of the interesting things, I think, about film music is, is that there's an expectation that you can do the job. When you go for a job as a composer, there's an expectation that from the music point of view, you're going to be able to do the job, right? So you know what music is. You know how to deliver recorded music to the standard that's required for the job. Otherwise, why would you be going for it? And why, in fact, would they employ you if you can't? So that's a taken, you know, so you can be, but you can be as brilliant as you like as a composer. You know, you can be so gifted musically as a composer. But if you don't understand what music is doing to a story and within a story, then it can't really work. Because otherwise it's like putting on your hobnail boots and tromping all over whatever it is that's, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, 
it's like singing a song at full volume all the way through you know it's like if all you're going to do is do that because that's what you can do then you're not going to be doing anyone any favors so i always say to to other students i think what really what did me the most good i think in my life before i was ever employed to do this job was understanding people and understanding motivation and story and that came about by several different routes one was uh i watched a lot of films you know like i would watch three or four films a day when i had no other responsibilities which was you know quite frequent in those days uh i would watch a lot of films and i just loved them and i think if you watch a lot of films you start to understand how they work you know it's like if you watch if i watch someone build a wall after about the 30th time i could probably build a wall you know i know what things are happening why things are happening and why they're doing that the way they're doing it it becomes sort of self-evident and we know that there's no right or wrong way to score a film and there's a million different ways to do it um but the singular voice that you have and the, the, the and what you bring to it is is entirely dependent on your experience of understanding story motivation people um and that's why I'm a big talker to people of everything. I tend to read lots of books, primarily biographies and autobiographies, because I love finding out about how people work. Um, so when you look at a movie for the first time, it's not just about where can I put music and how can I be wonderful. You know, it's 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 really it's really understanding where all the seeds are being planted in terms of the story and the character. And what you do to either nurture them or destroy them, depending on your take. But you have to know the reason why you're doing what you're doing. And you can't just write a piece of music because you think it's great and say, there you are. Because someone is going to say to you, why did you do that there? Why did you do that? And how does that help us down the road? What does that, how does that relate to that thing later? So you have to know why every note is there. So the music part of it is an important part of it. But I would I would say it's not the the most important part because in a way one without the other you're going to be severely handicapped I think in how you can apply it. It's like having the greatest toolkit in the world but not really knowing how an engine is built. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was it was during your Luton years that you you met with um, Danny Cannon, the director. And of course, yeah. you leapt into the spotlight by working on a on a film with him, The Young Americans. And there was a particular song from that film, Play Dead, by with Bjork. That the spotlight came straight onto you. It went number twelve in the UK charts. Uh, it's an amazing start for a career. I mean, did you get the feeling at that stage that I think I'm onto something here? I think, hello, this this is, feels good. Um, no, no. I mean, I, I initially, I started that song. I played it, to, or just in terms to set this up. I mean, Young Americans was a film. I was sharing a flat with Danny in London at the time, two bedroom flat. I was writing the film with what little equipment I had, and it really wasn't that much. Uh, and it was set up at the bottom of my bed in my bedroom in this two bedroom flat. And that's where I wrote it. And I was sitting on the edge of the bed and there was a little table uh, and it was done with VHS tape, guesswork, stopwatch um and then an atari 1040 and what was a, a, a steinberg pro 24 which was 24 channels 16 midi channels that was it and so there's a few sound making devices but not much uh, i can remember exactly what it was if anyone's interested it was a korg m1 it was a, a an akai s1000 and it was a Proteus orchestral module, which had like the principal orchestral sounds, eight channels of that. And then a Proteus orchestral percussion module, another eight channels of that. So it was all kind of squeezed together, you know, so it was quite basic, but enough to be able to play Danny something which resembled, you know, wh wh where we were going. Uh, and I had mapped out Play Dead as an idea early on and I played it to him and he didn't like it. So I didn't play it to him again until the end. And then he did like it. He'd forgotten that he'd heard it. <laughs> um, you know, so sometimes, you know, when something's working, 
but the initial i mean the initial thrust of that weirdly came from i, I went to see tori amos uh, i was at a songwriter's gig i used to have songwriters gigs in london it's horrible when you talk about things nowadays and you always preface it by saying there used to be all these amazing things that happened that don't happen anymore you know that's incredibly depressing and I think there's certainly room for a lot of these things to come back. There's certainly plenty of people who want to. Uh, but basically, these venues would put on songwriting nights. So there'd be people who were writers who you know, had publishing deals, people who didn't have publishing deals, some artists. they come down and for two and a half, two and a half hours, three hours, uh, they would try out new material, a bit like a stand-up gig, you know, like an open mic. You'd go out and you'd do five minutes and see how it was. Uh, and... Um, there were people in the audience looking for material. There were publishers. Uh, and I'd pop down and I'd just see if I could sing a song or, you know, or two. Um, and one night, Tori Amos was on. She'd recorded her first album but hadn't released it. And she was doing a couple of songs. Uh, and and she played a couple and it just like completely knocked me sideways. I thought she was amazing. Uh, and I came home and I thought, like, I want to write a song like one of hers. So I was just hammering away. She was very violent on the piano. For, for good reason, uh, but very physical with the piano. Uh, uh, and, and I wasn't, you know, I mean, I'm not the greatest piano player in the world. I, I use it for writing, but I'm not a performer, I'd say. Um, and uh, so anyway, I was hammering it out anyway. So the main thrust of it came from that hammering out thing late one night. And then I slow the thing right down, put it up on this picture with Harvey Cartel's coming to land into London. He's on a plane, he's being contemplative. And it's, you know, just like basically like a sort of C minor, seven which sort of goes into different inversions eventually sort of hits a, a sort of f minor nine uh and if you if you leave it long enough before the f happens it feels like it's got a lot more weight you know so the change happens and you feel like it's significant uh anyway so i was messing about with this idea and uh danny eventually liked it and Björk was living the next street from us now she had just finished recording debut her first album as a solo artist and that wasn't out either she gave me a cassette of it to listen to and it was obviously incredible play that obviously wasn't done at that point so it wasn't on the album uh so she I, anyway, I stuck a note through her i found out where she lived stuck a note through her front door and said we're doing this film do you fancy doing the you know do you want to come over and have a look at bits of it so she literally came around the house we showed her some stuff just on video and uh, she liked that. I played her a rough of the song, which was pretty basic, but enough for her to work with. I had a completely, I mean, I don't, I got asked at, at last year to write a song for a very famous person's record uh, with the idea that we write it together. He wanted me to do the lyrics, but to sort of half write the song and then send it to him and he would finish it. Now, I can't do it like that. I mean, I know people do, like they write a track and someone top lines it, but I know where everything's going. If I hear it, I hear it. And I couldn't figure out a way of involving this person in the writing of it without me writing a song and then rubbing half of it out. <laughs> uh, and it just didn't make sense. And I just couldn't get my head around it. Um, but what was weird, so Play Dead was kind of like complete as a song, but in order for Björk to have a creative input into it, I actually did. I just gave her the track without the top line and the lyric. Gave her some ideas for lyrics, uh, like, you know, it's, uh, play dead, it stops her hurting, uh, and it's sometimes just like sleeping work, lyrics that we gave her, uh, and as a sort of guide, you know, and I gave her the song, and what she came back with was completely different to what I'd done, but was obviously dynamically incredible, uh, and it was, it was literally like sort of three days later we recorded it, uh, and it was a bit of a mess because I was so inexperienced. The first thing I'd ever done where there'd been any money, you know, I mean, the, the odd bits and pieces that I did for National Film and Television School where I wasn't officially there. So I didn't have access to any of the facilities or anything. Um, I was paying for stuff myself. Um, and the idea of working with Click was like, it was weird. I'd never done it before. Uh, the equipment wasn't easy to come by when you are on your own. Um, uh, with no one to help you and I didn't go to college you know to learn any of this stuff so I didn't really know how a lot of it worked I was reading manuals for years you know so I knew how all the gear worked I knew how it worked technically but I didn't really know how it applied to picture um, so it was a bit hit and miss uh, and I made the mistake of 
recording the orchestra first i had to for economic reasons because we didn't have money to do it as a separate session for the record so it was the last three minutes of the session the song was three minutes long they sight read it and that was what you got i mean the record was that's a sight read that track now there's a certain energy to that when it happens because everyone's absolutely on the edge of their seat thinking we're going to make it i mean we did literally sort of stop but there are fluffs in it we can't do anything about you know there's a couple of horn splits and some weird things but it had a it had an energy which was undeniably you know uh, yeah essential and i made the mistake of of then trying to put drums on it and you know with the best will in the world with an orchestra even with a click it's gonna shift a little bit uh, and i just couldn't get obviously the drums i couldn't get them to fit at all the bass Every time you get into a pattern, the orchestra would shift. So that was a disaster. So we had to actually chop up the orchestra post the recording into two bar sections and time each two bar section. So it would be, it could stay in time that then we could then put the uh, the drums and the bass on. So these are all important lessons. <laughs> uh, uh, and after all that, you know, it, then it was like it had become her biggest hit and went on to debut. And all of a sudden, there's another world opens up. You know, the the the, the people who who previously had said no idea who you are became oh you did that. You know, so all of a sudden, I was getting asked to do records, and on the other hand, I was getting asked to do films. So it went from nothing to kind of everything in about a three or four month period. But I mean, I was thirty at the time, I think. So that was you know, it was a long yeah. slope. From it, it was short, shortly after Young Americans that Dean Devlin, the producer, and Roland Emmerich um, got you on board Stargate. And of course, shortly after that, Independence Day, for which you, you got a Grammy. And um, I mean, what, what, what strikes me about both films is it's very American patriotic films. And were, did you feel they were taking a gamble on this young, upcoming Brit composer? Um, well, Stargate was, I suppose, nationality less in a way. I mean, there's some Americanisms in it, um, but not really. You know, I mean, there's an American army aspect in it, but basically it was it was set on another planet and it didn't really matter where anyone came from. Um, so we were stateless in that regard. Um, there was a queue on, on Young Americans called uh, Christian's Requiem, which was, a for me, it was like me trying to be... Ennio Morricone, uh, uh, in um, uh, you know, in some of the sort of darker, more dramatic um, writing, um, but you know, I had a choir on it, and it was it was a big, bold, very cinematic piece of music. In retrospect, possibly too big for the film, but you know, Danny liked a cinematic view of everything. So it was for a big funeral sequence and it was a very emotional and it was a sort of montage thing. Uh, and we wanted it to be heightened. We wanted it to be operatic and grand. And I go, all right, this is perfect. Um, so anyway, so they heard that and liked that. And that was the thing that they said, would you do Stargate? Now, I've got to say, this is a very, very rare occurrence. You know, I'd had one British film that hadn't come out when we were talking about Stargate. So no one knew if it was going to be successful right. or not successful. And basically sort of one cue that they like the sound of. Now, I can't tell you why they said, why they offered that to me. Because I went in, I flew over uh, to the Karolko building on Sunset. Uh, and uh, Mario Casar was the producer. Uh, and he made, you know, he made the Rambo films and Terminator. You know, it's like he, he's one of these Hollywood producers. I think he had the original Turin shroud you know that kind of thing and um and and um so he watched the americans liked it suggested uh danny go and speak to uh, uh andy vanya about doing judge dread and he suggested to uh roland and dean you should see david about the music so i, I got flown over and i met them uh and i didn't know what i was doing you know, I mean, I, I was 29, I think, 30. Only just done one movie, one paid for film, you know, I don't know, 25 student films, whatever it was. 
uh, going back going back some time. Um, and so I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in this, you know, in, in this meeting. I don't know what you do. And I was on the plane and I was reading uh, Premiere, as it was then, you know, one of the film magazines when there was more than one, when it was more than Empire. Again, we're going back to remember when there were all these different things. Uh, there used to be quite a few film magazines that were all really interesting. I used to read all of them. Uh, anyway, it was Premiere. And there was an article on pitching um, script ideas. You know that when he when it boils down to it, you have to be able to say it's like uh, it's like Jaws on a boat, right? You have to be able to say things that are easily consumed by idiots. I think um, it might not be fair, uh, but anyway. So I thought, like, well, what is this? I read the script. I thought, well, what is this really? I, and I came in and I did this whole thing. I said, basically, I said it's Star Wars meets Lawrence of Arabia. Um, you know, very easily understandable in terms of branding, very easily understandable in terms of the texture maybe and the reach of it. Um, and I went, uh, and they seemed to like that and they asked, me, they asked me to do it. When I was in that office, there were, there must've been 25, I think they were CDs in those days, um, like show reels from so Jerry Goldsmith, James Horner, you know, everyone, James Newton Howard, everyone was, everyone's agent was pitching them, you know, to, to for the movie so i still can't tell you why they 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 took a chance on me i got no idea oh, it's but it worked still, out all right yeah. and to go on to it independence right. day and it just you know i think everyone remembers that white house sequence <laughs> and the scene. yeah yeah i mean yeah they, they they've used it it's been a few i mean in a way, if you think about that film, the most American of all American films, I mean, the director was German, uh, the cinematographer was German, the creature design was Greek, the composer was British, um, the uh, producer and co-writer was Filipino. Um, I, you know, there was hardly any Americans involved. So in a way, we're all sitting there sort of chuckling away going, let's do this. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and I just said, look, I said, in this film, I said, I've never seen a film like it. I've never seen so many people saluting so many times. <laughs> you know, uh, in fact, when we did it, I did it at the Albert Hall where we projected it and did the orchestra. Uh, and I did a little talk beforehand and I said, look, I said, there's so many, there's so much saluting in this film. I said, every time someone salutes, let's all shout, hey, like that. Towards the end of the film, that's all you could hear was people shouting because it was just constant this, <laughs> you know, everyone's doing that all the time. <laughs> but that kind of that kind of feeds into the idea that it's 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 kind of Copeland magnified. Um, but there's always a tiny little bit of 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 cynicism, you know, a tiny bit. But I think what I tried to do with that film was to be brutally honest with it and serve it as what it was was not what I thought I should try and imprint on it you know because it was trying to uh, it was trying to be what it, it never pretended to be anything else other than what it was I read a couple of interviews later with Dean when he said it was a film it was about the world coming together under a common threat and I go no not really it's blowing shit up <laughs> spectacularly you know yeah. and having these and having these amazing what if moments you know so I was responding to the the general enthusiasm of Roland and Dean in making those images, you know, because it was hugely exciting. And I was there when they blew the White House. I went to visit them and they'd made the thing and it was 50 feet long, you know, it was an enormous thing and they'd rigged it with squibs and explosives and petrol and everything. And I was there when they shot it. I think they had like 12 cameras on it all running different speeds. Uh, and when they blew it up, it literally just went and that was it. You know, it took about four seconds. <laughs> from start to finish I mean, all right you know i'm glad they fit you know they filmed that because you could never build the thing again um so i was watching them doing all these effects and then they started coming back and going this is amazing um and so for, uh, you know like like a lot of the time if i'm writing a film which is so huge in its messaging um i feel like let's give it a big theme you know because all of those great morricone and williams and john barry uh, you know, they all had huge themes that, you know, that just made you go, yes. And so I wrote something which for me, like I wrote a national anthem for the world that that film existed in. 
that's the that was the idea of it. It's terrific. And you weren't you weren't tempted to stay in America. You, I mean, you fundamentally a British. I got asked to stay there quite a lot of time. Yeah, I mean, I, I got asked to be there, but I realised I was being asked to be there by people who felt it would be better for me, but I don't think it would be because all you would do would do more of the same, but over there. And I didn't want to just do film. I mean, I loved it, but, you know, I loved all the other things as well. And all of a sudden, you know, to have opportunities starting to open up to you to do all these other things, there was an incredible pressure to do film after film after film when you're in America, when you're in Hollywood especially. You know, they think you're an idiot for saying no to anything. And I was very happy to say no to things because I thought like, well, if I don't really want to do it, then I'm not going to do it. And that was the first ever exchange I had with my agent because I got Stargate without an agent, um, which is another unusual thing. I had no representation at all. I'd attempted. I mean, I, I went around all the agencies in Hollywood with the young Americans and no one was interested um and so and then of course when stargate happened then the same people all start phoning up you know saying we think we know what's best for you so um i stuck with this guy and i'm still with him you know he's brilliant Vez Vangelos, he's brilliant called first artist which is a, he even let me think up the name for his agency and <laughs> um he uh which i've since subsequently found out it's some sports agency as well so you know we think we're being original and then we find ourselves in court that's the uh, film composer's lament, isn't it? Um, so, uh, well, so, David, um, time's coming yeah, on. So I, to, I, I should get on to. I guess there's quite a few um, Bond fans um, desperate to kind of hear Bond questions. I was hoping we could eke it out so, like, we we could avoid it completely. Squeeze it into two questions at the end. I know, um, I'm joking. I'm I mean, joking. the obvious. I know, I know. I would never. I'm going to avoid the obvious. How did that. you get the gig? Because I think all the Bond fans know there's various theories of. Barbara Brock yeah. being a record yeah, shop good. or MGM, whatever. Yeah. But I was yeah. wondering the effects yeah. oh. on, on yourself of the, you know, to, to go off, you know, massive film like Independence Day and and onto a franchise in effect, you know, a 30 year old franchise with an established style, tone, and almost style of music. And I, I remember, you know, when you came on board Tomorrow Never Dies, um, the notion that you were going to kind of dip your finger in the past, but also set something for the future. I mean, how, how was the pressure mm. during that period of expectation? Um, well, I never really noticed it at the time because Barbara and Michael were so wonderful at employing who they think is the right person to do the job and then letting them do it. Um, they are, at the same time, very much like those inflatable bumpers at a bowling alley you know they're not going to let you go too far down there because you might do some damage you know but you can go whatever route you want but we kind of need to be going over there um they're brilliant at that and they're always right of course they're going to be right uh and um i never really do you know what i never i, I never really felt it till after till i had to do it again Till, till uh, the world is not enough. Uh, because when you're doing your first one, like first of anything, it's like no one knows, no one has any expectations of you other than, is it gonna be as good as John Barry? That's usually, that's usually the, 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 uh, your, your entry point as a composer for James Bond, no matter how many other people have done it. Um, you know, that's still the enormous, you know, looming, flag of genius which you find fluttering over all your work uh and uh you can either choose to ignore it or or embrace it or you know adapt it or do you know do whatever you, whatever you like but it's definitely there and i think obviously the thing is though that, i mean that audience is obviously getting older and older and getting further and further away you know so the you know a lot of people now are in a bond have never even seen the Sean Connery movies or, or heard the John Barry scores, you know. So this is a shifting uh, uh, a vista, you know, uh, but you, you can only respond to it the most honest way that you can respond to it. Um, so I kind of did a lot of what I wanted to do in that film uh, and they let me do it. And I was astonished. I mean, in a way, it was a bit like Independence Day, like no one was telling me to do it differently. You know, I mean, we had to change bits and pieces. You know, there was little bits of tweaking here and there. But no one said, this isn't working. 
you know, it was like, you know, the president's speech, I think we went over it once or twice. I had one visit from Dean when he was saying there's just a there's just some emphasis that he wanted on certain words at certain moments but that was it it wasn't like this ain't working you know so the whole of the all of these films i mean stargate they never even heard it until we got to the recording studio i played them some demos you know roughly but with you know the gear wasn't around then really to 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 mock up the score like you would now so they heard the principal themes but they'd never heard the score till we recorded it and that's always the way it used to be i mean alfred hitchcock famously on a documentary once he was asked about what does he think about film composers he says he goes well they're all bastards aren't they you know they uh, you know they sit there on the piano and they say this is going to be flute and this is going to be horns and this is going to be this is going to be strings and it's all going to be like this and then you get to the studio and it's not like that and then they say oh, it's too late now we're <laughs> you know we're all here so uh, you know that element of of trust and luck has gone and i think maybe there's a bit of um I think something else has been lost in that as well. You know, the trust that you would have in another artist to add something to to, to a movie. Um, uh, but going back to the Bond thing, um, I think they were very happy for it to go in a slightly different direction. And the fact that I obviously love John Barry's work and uh, had made a record where I very obviously had, you know, displayed my affection for it. Uh, and I think especially with the uh, um, the, uh, uh, the the propeller heads uh, track that I did with them with on a Mansion Secret Service, that, you know, that nine minute version of that tune uh, was the one I think convinced them more than anything that it felt like, well, this is something that's sort of happening now, but it still feels like it's, you know, harking back to the glory days as well, you know, so it doesn't feel like it's a compromise. It feels like it's a new direction uh and you know there were lots of different styles in that as well you know i mean tomorrow never dies starts off kind of traditional orchestral uh moves to germany where it becomes sort of techno in a lot of ways moves to china where it becomes quite sort of ethnic and world music and and um you know real world and ends up with a obviously you know the the, the big shootout and the fight on the on the you know the, the the kind of stealth boat at the end so it travels a lot you know i mean it does there's a lot of different sort of stylistic things um but all held together with this singular approach to again this is john's approach this isn't my idea you write a song and that is the skeleton upon which the body is formed you know it's like it's all dependent on whether that form is correct in the first place uh, and then you can change it based on on where you are. But so I always approach it by writing. It's the same as writing a theme if you need to. Uh, wrote the song first, took it to it. Never really felt the pressure of what it was until the next one when all of a sudden it's like, okay, you did that once. Now what? Yeah. Now what are you going to do? And also they let me have the the title song for the first time, you know, and you, you do feel that a bit. But, you know, I've never really worried about that it's like when I did the Olympics and funny enough like doing doing the Albert Hall thing you know I'm a film composer writing a you know a basically a 90 minute concert piece for the Albert Hall's 150th birthday which is hugely important for them and it's completely not the sort of thing that I've ever done before and they let me drive the entire thing they let me design the show they let me choose what I did they let me get involved in all anything that was visual that was happening um, it was a bit like being a director, writer, director of a film, I think. Um, and I never really, and I still don't feel like there was pressure on me. The, 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 the problem with that is then you never really feel that response for it afterwards. You know, it's like, I'm just, I'm always relieved when people are happy. You know, I'm relieved when people like it. But the odd thing I've found with music is that a lot of the time I never feel that it's 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 really, truly something that I've done. You know, it's like, you know, when people say, oh, this is my music. I say, well, I know I've kind of written it, but I don't feel like I've written it. I feel like I've been a conduit to something. I feel like I've, I'm a TV set that's tuned into something and something's on and I'm able to show it to you. You know, I never feel that I've I've done it it's a very interesting experiment i did with a, a a brain specialist called um sophie scott 
um, and we were doing a, 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 an, an experiment on how music works in the brain, how, you know, how, how it affects your brain. And why does music do what it does to your brain? You know, short answer is we don't know, but we did an MRI thing. I was did a 90 minute MRI with all sorts of different experiments in an MRI, which was to do with composition and listening to music, how your body responds to it. And when you hear music, your brain is illuminated in every area. Every area that your brain has function in is stimulated by music. It's the only thing that does it. It's like flooding your brain with some kind of weird chemical, but it's sound. Uh, and so music does that. Don't really know why, but it stimulates everything, which is why it can make you feel sad or happy or cry or excited, makes you run faster, makes you feel like you want to drive quicker, everything. Um, they did a part, part of this experiment was um, they would show me words because obviously you can't have anything metal in there. Um, so they were projecting something in glass tubes uh, and they would be like, if a red word turned up, something like forest, I had to just think of the word forest. If that word forest was green, I had to compose a piece of music based on that word, what I felt about that word. It wasn't for anything specific. They said, just in your mind, write music. And afterwards, when we were going through all the results, and I said, what was really astonishing was that when you are composing music, the only part of your brain that's not engaged in that process was memory. So when you're making something completely new, you're not relying on something that's happened before. Now, I don't know if that's profound or whatever it is, but it's fascinating when you're creating something. Yeah. I mean, something that's unique to you, David, on, on the Bond is that you worked not only on five Bonds, but with five different directors. And I mean, I'm interested in more of the kind of composer director relationship on such a big feature, such as Bond. I mean, do they have much influence on you? Yeah. Are, are, are there various types? Well, when we, you know, when we do these things, everyone has to be on the same bus, you know, uh, and that happens fairly early on. Um, and I would assume that the directors that I was lucky enough to work with agreed to have me on because they agreed with what I was saying that I would do for it and based on the previous experience I'd had with Barbara and Michael. So I'm assuming that everyone thought, okay, this is, I, I was trying to be in a position where, like I do in all films, is that you're not gonna have to worry about music, right? Music isn't something you're not gonna, you're not gonna have to worry about it. You can worry about other things. You're not gonna have to worry about this. So you give them confidence to let you do what you do. Uh, and there are a million different ways of doing that. Um, but the other thing with Bond is that it's so, they're so vast. The films are so vast. And the post-production process is actually quite concertina. Um, I, think, I think on Casino Royale, I think from the end of principal photography to first day recording was six weeks. And that's a massive film, you know, with a lot of music. I'd done some stuff previous to it based on rough cuts and everything. So we were definitely, the first half of the film was a lot of rejigging stuff and re-editing things, which is never pleasant. Um, but the further along we got, then, you know, the more we were able to stick to the, to the cut. Um, and in that process, in that concertina post-production process, there's so many other things that a director has to be doing. He's got to be uh, supervising all the visual effects and the grading and the ADR uh, and whatever, you know, if they have to do reshoots or pickups or bits and pieces. They don't have that much time for music. You know, they don't have that much time. But I send them everything and it's always in the cutting room and they're able to watch cuts and, and, and cues with the editors. Uh, and I get notes and bits and pieces from them, but they don't come over very often because, you know, it's it's a, it's even if it's an hour or an hour and a half, you know, if you're if you're doing 20 hour days and that's quite oh, a big boy. chunk of it. Um, and I was just, you know, I was I was very I was very fortunate. I got on very well with all of them. Uh, and I think I was lucky that they liked what I was doing. No one said this isn't working. Let's not do it. There's one, only one moment, I think, in Casino Royale, I think on one of the, uh, one of the uh, card games with, uh, I think it's one of the, the central one that was slightly more nebulous. Um, they wanted a bit more tension because they realised that it's basically people playing cards. So, you know, it wasn't reading as, as dynamic, maybe as, as tense. So there was a little bit of going backwards and forwards on that. 
And there's another note from Barbara on Casino Royale, uh, which was key actually, and very astute, um, and something that I hadn't thought of, uh, which was, um, I'd written a, uh, a theme for Vespa, the character Vespa, which, is, which was fragile and um, very open. Uh, and, and I was playing this, when they were, she was in the shower, she just witnessed Bond kill three people. And she had blood on her fingers and on her hands. And she was in the shower in her clothes with the water running down on her crying. And he comes in himself, covered in blood and bruised and I think he had hatchet cuts on him and he sits down next to her and he put his arm around her says Are you cold and she he turns the tap on so it's a bit warmer and he licks some of the blood from her fingers you know cleans her and then we pull away there's a long pull away and my original take on that was I was playing her thing I was playing her this is how fragile she is this is how damaged she can be uh, this is how much he needs to protect her, you know. So it's basically a need in her for him and him responding to her need by being there. But Barbara said that we need that to be the start of their love affair because that's the point when he makes a big move, in a way, emotionally, by offering her his protection uh, and attention and understanding. Uh, and so I kind of did the opposite of what I did. I started off the same, but as soon as he kind of puts his arm around her um, and we pull away, I start on actually a very warm love theme, which completely changes the way that you look at that scene. I wouldn't have done yeah. that without Barbara sort of instinctively saying, this is where something has started. And maybe, maybe that's a bloke thing, you know, <laughs> not seeing something so very obvious happening in front of you emotionally. I well, don't know. It's actually really but, interesting, um, David. You know, because... There's things like that which are... That... Because of a strong kind of female characters in Bond. I mean, the scores, the, the, the pieces that you've written from Vespa, Paris, Electra, Jinx, Camille. I mean, wow. But I realise time's coming. I need to segue also into characters in television. Sherlock, Dracula, whatever. Establishing a theme for a character, yeah. how difficult is that? Um, I suppose that's like saying, how easy is it to write a really good novel? <laughs> I yes, mean, I don't know if you know it's any good <laughs> until you've done it. I mean, I mean, I've always, I mean, this was one thing that I learned when I was doing art, there's an A-level, and then I did a foundation year in art because I wasn't sure if I was going to do music or art. Um, that when we were painting things or creating anything visually, creatively, um, was it's always a good idea to take a step back from it and see if it's actually finished, you know, because you can spend so much time getting closer and closer and closer and hatching at tiny little things, which ultimately might not be important. Um, it's always a good idea to take a step away and listen to a piece of music and just say, is that it? Is that actually it? You know, I can... I can still, you know, orchestrate stuff, you know, I mean, I can add colours to it, but what you're looking at is that this, you know, the sketch of the Eiffel Tower, yeah, I could put some lights in under here, you know, but it's still going to look like that, and is that it? You know, I can paint it this different colour, but is that it? You have to know what it is that you are doing, and when you have realised the thing, sometimes you get to that point because that, that is it, and it's also shit. So in the bin it goes and you start again. Um, I think part of it is understanding when you think you've written, I mean, when I write themes, I, kind, I think I kind of approach it from a sort of singer's perspective in a way. You know, the greatest music for me, melodic music has always been sort of like of a folk tradition, you know, when when melodies are so strong that they are passed down from generation to generation, they might change slightly on the way, but there is something so we cannot go anywhere other than where this goes. You know, this melody is going somewhere and we cannot go anywhere else. And when you write something thematically for me, I kind of feel like I have to follow it. It might take me up a blind alley and it will be something that I don't want it to be necessarily, but you have to facilitate its creation. 
you know you can't impose what you think it should be doing you have to kind of allow it it's an odd it's an odd relationship that i have with with melody writing and i love it but i kind of disassociate myself from what i'm doing which is going back to this thing about not necessarily feeling responsible for some of the writing that i've done you know some of it is born out of really hard work and and you know chipping away at it until you do discover it but some of it just sort of turns up in a way that that i can't explain um and um other than it was probably there anyway and i just tuned into it um but i always like to think if i sing this out loud where would i go and sometimes i do sing it out loud and then you automatically feel like and if you stand up and sing it out loud it takes you to a load of different places physicality you know the idea that you're going to be sitting at a piano the whole time doing this not always the best thing to do sometimes stand on a chair I mean, you might make yourself look stupid, but these are all methods that remove you from the process of being so intrinsically on top of it. And it allows you to stand outside of it and A, examine what you've done from a, it's almost like you're giving yourself advice. When you're not in your physical space that you'll do this job, you can be somewhere else and you're listening to it you can give yourself advice. Sometimes even just playing the thing, turn your back on it so the stereo image is reversed. You know, you're listening to it in a slightly different way. Get someone in who you trust to play it to. So guarantee, if you're playing someone a piece of music, you will know when you don't like a bit because you're going to wish they hadn't heard it. <laughs> you know, and sometimes you really feel like it is right and you just want them to experience it so you know that, you know, I'm just checking. Um, but the idea that you can intellectualize uh, every aspect of, 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 of composition uh, and have a schooled formal response to everything compositionally, uh, I found to be largely untrue. Probably just about every sort of music I've ever been involved in. In terms of, because uh, I need to go pop and tell a bit, I've only got a couple more questions and I should have opened it out. I realize we're running out of time. With TV series, Sherlock, Little Britain, Good Omens, Dracula, all multi-episodic, you know, it's like a serial. Um, how, how different is your approach to a kind of episodic um, series? And it's just something like a full-blown feature film. Um, well, I've always said, people ask me, like, is it different, you know, writing for James Bond versus Space or God or a talking lion or Paul or hot fuzz you know it's like well I'm usually doing it in the same space and this has been true since I was doing stuff you know for the national film television school not officially but when students would give me their films I'd be sitting on the end of my bed with my limited equipment writing responding to what I was seeing and what's changed well apart from expectation and budget really nothing because that's all the job is really isn't it I mean it's <laughs> like looking at a vis something visually and responding to it musically. That's the starting point. So I sit down and I watch something and it will make me think of something or it won't. I'll feel something or I won't. Um, and with, with TV, you realize that there's a longer distance to cover. You know, there's more to cover. Um, it also, you know, I mean, the shows that I've done, there's none of them have been Oh, that's a bit like that. You know, Sherlock, I know, you know, I mean, I wrote that with Michael Price uh, and Dracula as well. You can't say that those shows, oh, that's a show that's a bit like that, you know, like, like this detective thing or that drama, you know. Little Britain wasn't anything that was like that. Good Omens is nothing like anything I've ever seen. Uh, do you know what I mean? It's like they've yeah, yeah. all required something very idiosyncratic because they are inherently idiosyncratic and there's no way that you can get away with damage loop one you know for 10 minutes and then some chords kind of ebbing in and out of it you know these things require you write you create as originally as hopefully as possible as what you're seeing they demand it i've only so got one more question that they, david that, um because okay. i realize time's coming on um You've worked on an animation, uh, The Tiger Who Came to Tea. How fun was that? Yeah, first one ever. 
Uh, do you know, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'd never done it before and I was terrified because when I got a call about it, A, I love the book, obviously. You know, it's one of those books. It was 50 years old. Everyone who's got children has this book. It's still got its own, you know, compartment in Waterstones. You know, it's got a whole shelf and then you've got toys and you've got, you've got a version of it which is like squashy foam and then there's a sort of velvet one and there's a hardback and a softback and a big one and a small you know there's thousands of them it's such a brilliant brilliant story uh and quite weird but brilliant uh, and when they were going to make it as an animation i thought like i really have to do i've never done anything like that something that actual little children would like uh and but they said the dreaded j word they said jazz now i'm nowhere near jazz in any way shape or form i do not understand jazz i appreciate jazz i also appreciate that it's a very specific set of skills like liam neeson you know it's like it's very specific and i don't have those so i was really disappointed and i thought well, maybe if I just go and talk to them and see what they mean, because one of the things you learn about this job is that people say something to you about what they want. But if you give them what they want, they realize that it wasn't what they wanted in the first place. So I thought, <laughs> well, I want to find out what they mean by jazz, because obviously jazz is vast. Uh, as vast as my catalog, very vast. And um, uh, <laughs> and so I thought I just wanted what I just wondered what they meant. And um, I was thinking. I said, well, what do you, you know, so when you mean jazz, I said, what do you mean? And anyway, we got talking about it and it became sort of evident that what they meant was the sort of freedom of it. And I thought, and I said to him, so look, I'm not really jazzy. I said, but in order for us not to disappoint ourselves, can I write you something that I think would work for it? And if you don't like it, we can shake hands and go away. If you do like it, we can, we can do the movie. It just seems like a sensible thing to do. You know, if you're going to employ me to do it and you want a voice, a musical voice for this film, I'll do it for you for nothing um, and see what you think. Anyway, I've been listening to loads and loads of old sort of, you know, with jazz in mind. I've been listening to loads of old um, sort of 50s and 60s um, big band uh, stuff uh, and especially Burt Camphart. Um, and Bert Camphart was a, a band leader and a composer who wrote Strangers in the Night, uh, who had a sort of string of what is probably the most joyous instrumental music I've ever heard. You know, it's so skippy and happy and carefree. And, you know, he was a big bloke who drank beer with the brass players and, um, you know, ran this band for years. But he wrote these incredibly happy, chirpy kind of things. And that felt like if you want someone kind of who's got that kind of swagger uh, uh, and, um, you know, sort of devil may care kind of thing, it's kind of like a little bit of both. It's got the swagger, but it's also got the innocence. Um, so I thought, like, I'm going to nick a few of those kind of compositional ideas, which is the kind of muted, you know, two basses. One was a stand up sort of walk in jazz bass. And the other one was doubling the first note of each bar with a with a electric bass, heavily damped, played with a pick. So we'd have a, like a dong dong ga dong dong ga dong ga dong ga dong ga dong. You'd also have like dong 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 ga dong ga dong like that, and shuffle brushes. You know, and then you just got like the happiest tune in the world. With the swing safari you know and then he repeats it again the john barry trick play the theme play the theme play the theme he plays the theme he plays it again octave up plays it again with the strings and then he plays it again where it was at the start and that's the end of it so you basically heard this thing from like eight times and funnily enough you remember it um, oh, that's terrific. So that's that terrific. was my that was yeah. my starting point was that kind of swinging, loose, loose kind of thing, and everything sort of went from there. Really, I and should bring like, Duncan so. in here. Um, um, I, I'm I'm not dry of questions. I could go on all night, but um, Duncan, we need to hear questions from our audience. Okay, cool. Thank you very much for that, David, and 
sorry for the overuse of the word vast. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, first question is from no, Reese. No, vast was all right. It's very vast. This is very okay. an interesting one. I'm not. I'm not eloquent. Um, right. First question is from Reese. Uh, when did you first know you were going to be a composer? Um, my mum's got an exercise book from school when I, from when I was five. When it says, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" Uh, and he said, I wanted to be a musician or an actor. So somewhere between the two of those is probably film composer. Um, but I had a conversation with Billy Bragg once about the course of one's career, you know, and that a lot of the time people in music might have started in bands or wanted to be in bands, wanted to play and do that sort of thing. Uh, and I was definitely interested in that kind of thing because of the songs. Uh, and I said, look, you know, it's getting to the point when I knew that wasn't ever really going to happen. And he said, it's always a good idea, David, to, you know, to be aware that you're never going to get to say thank you, Wembley, good night. Oh. Oh, it's, so, it's a very sobering moment when you know that's not going to be in your arsenal. But I think I will at some point. I mean, I played a pub in Wembley once just so I could say that. <laughs> um, the next question is from Connor, uh, who's an alumnus. Uh, which Bond cue, big or small, went through the most iterations and was the most challenging to put together? You may have answered that. Um, the, African, the, the African foot chase at the start of Casino Royale. Uh, when I saw it, it was 17 minutes long. Uh, when I started writing it, it was 13 minutes long. When I finished writing it, it was nine minutes long. So it had lost 35% of its body by the time it saw the cinemas. Um, and those things, you know, you take a lot of time creating the dramatic arc of a cue over that amount of time. And it always feels like you're really hobbling it when you have to cut into a cue because they've decided, the worst thing is when they reposition scenes, not when they make it shorter, but when they reposition something dramatically that happens. So if someone gets hit with something at, at two minutes and 10 seconds and they move that to one minute and 10 seconds, then you know the whole journey up to that moment then is completely hobbled and you have to sometimes completely rewrite it. That took, it took a couple of weeks just on that one cue. Uh, that was the most changed cue in all of them. But it was a massive, massive sequence. You know, I mean, even with it kind of con, 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 concentrated and, 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 uh, and, and adjusted and made smaller, uh, I, might, I might run actually, I think it ended up being 11 minutes. Um, uh, it's still like almost... Um, you know, sort of fifteen percent of the entire film score, just that one piece. Um, uh, Joe asks, really enjoyed your ARI award-winning Scala radio series, The Music of James Bond, and your sixth music series, Sound of Cinema. Do you have any other radio shows or series brewing? Also, any chance of Stargate with a live score at the Royal Albert Hall? Um, uh, I, I, I did have an idea for a podcast, but everyone's doing them now. So I don't know if I'll do it. I mean, I, I was looking at, I was looking at podcasts this morning and it's like, there's literally thousands of them. A lot of them are brilliant. A lot of them are sharing the same people, you know, talking about slightly different things. You know, you can, you can find, you can find Russell Brand, you know, talking about spirituality. You can also find him talking about what he wants for his breakfast or you can find him talking about his favorite biscuits, you know, all these things. I love, um, but um, anyway, I had an idea, which I'm not gonna give it away because I think it could still work, but it is, uh, it's, it's very dry uh, and I think it could be funny and touching, uh, but at the moment, no more production radio things. I mean, I, we, we, we're, we're gonna update the um, Scala Bond series for No Time To Die, because um, I think we're gonna get hold of a few cues for that and I'm gonna talk to Hans about that as well just to keep that up to date and i think they're then rebroadcasting that in the lead up to uh, the release of the new film uh, was that all the questions there was stargate live at the royal Albert hall oh yes stargate live um 
I don't know that there would be a big enough audience for that. I mean, the weird thing for me, it feels like Stargate happened yesterday, but it was 1994. You know, so it's yeah, getting on for 30 years. It's so, it's so disturbing to find people coming up to me at concerts and going like, I've been listening to you since I was a kid. And they're adults. And I go, well, that's not right. And then you realise that actually, no, these things are 30 years old. You know, Play Dead in 18 months' time is going to be 30 years old, which, which blows my mind. Um, uh, next question is... Because I'm definitely for... older than that now. <laughs> um, asking a question from a friend who can't make it tonight. If you did another Bond... Would there be a tone or element from a previous soundtrack you would like to incorporate or a new sound that you would like to use? Uh, we talk, if we're talking about something that someone else had done, I would say no. If it's something that I would have done, well, I felt like in Quantum of Solace, it felt like we were heading down another avenue, which I really liked. Um, it was deliberate and it was different. Um, and there were things that were starting to be different that I really liked and felt like it was kind of clinging to Daniel a lot more. What was interesting about Casino Royale is that the story was not so much about Daniel's Bond, but Bond becoming James Bond. So that was a kind of uh, journey in music which had to have a, a, a climax, and the climax was when we cut to black at the end after he shot Mr. White and, you know, he says the name's Bond, James Bond, and we cut to black and then we hear the theme for the first time. That was our, our point of, uh, of arrival, I suppose. How do we musically make sense of the James Bond theme ever having existed? Um, and Quantum of Solace was like, well, okay, now he's James Bond. Now what? Now we have to find a way of it being him. And I think we started doing that with uh, with 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 cues like Inside Man, which was like a shorter thing, but it was a slightly sort of brutal, more, you know, it's kind of like guitar and orchestra. Um, it felt like it was something interesting. And Night of the Opera was a cue that, you know, felt like it was kind of ha harking back to sort of classic Bond stuff, but also, you know, shifting forward again. Um, and so I would have liked to have continued that idea, but I think now Daniel's finished, you know, if ever there was a new one and if anyone ever asked me to do it again, then, uh, I think we'd be very much back to the drawing board because I wouldn't really want to try and do what I've already done again. And I'm sure people have had enough of that anyway. Uh, <laughs> That's where the chat goes wild. <laughs> I love Night of the Opera, but anyway, um, okay, so last two questions. Uh, is there a recording of last week's Royal Albert Hall concert planned? Uh, and David says he was um, well, what's really interesting about that was that there were there were no broadcasters in, in, interested in it, which I found quite astonishing. Uh, there was no, um, yeah, no broadcasters, not Radio 3, not Radio 4, no TV. Um, and I thought, well. I've done quite a lot of work on this. I don't want this to just be, I mean, what was magical about it was that it was for the people that were there. It was a bit like if you'd seen the opening ceremony, of the Olympic games, and it had never been on telly, you know, it felt like that having been to both, uh, you know, there was that amount of excitement that happened. Um, and the energy of people willing it to be wonderful uh, was, was incredibly beneficial you know there was a real exchange of something on monday which was performance and audience each turning the heat up on each other you know there's a proper exchange of 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 of, of, of cultural creative um um action i suppose you could call it uh, it just felt like everything landed uh, and it's very rare that it happens that 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 wonderfully um, um, and so I thought, like, well, I don't want to, I don't want that to be the only. Anyway, so the bottom line is, uh, in the hall we had three cameras around uh, around the hall because we were projecting some stuff on soloists and orchestral thing, uh, and that was recorded by the hall for archive purposes. Um, I have a full mic 
um, like 140 channels of audio from the show uh, that I am attempting to start a mix on at the moment. Uh, I think I'm going to start it next week. But I've listened to a lot of it and it's it's live. So obviously there's things that are, you know, you'd like to be slightly better or there's a couple of fluffs or some splits where you get in any sort of live performance. Um, I don't know how fixable they're going to be, but um, yeah, I think it's certainly good enough to work on. So I've started on that. So because I wouldn't want it to be a memory in 5,000 people's minds and, you know, only ever to be talked about by other people you know, like other people to hear it, see if it actually was any good, you know. It might be in the cold light of day that it's awful. Okay. And the very last I wouldn't question... wouldn't want to get above my station. <laughs> uh, I loved Made in Dagenham, the musical. Would you like to write another hmm. musical? I'd love to write another musical. Writing that musical was one of the happiest times of my entire life professionally. Uh, and I think part of the reason was the people that I was working with on it um, and that we could actually be funny and irreverent and really rude. Uh, and it was an interesting place to be on a musical that when you are a composer on a musical, you are far higher up the ladder in terms of how you are considered in the pecking order than you are in film. You know, you're one of the two biggest voices. There's the writer of the book, lyric, music and director they can fire the director uh you know it's um uh so that was interesting that when i say on a monday night i don't think the end's working and i think we should be doing this and then you come in the next day and you've got like 50 or 60 crew building a new set based on the thing that you said the night before that's an unusual experience but the thing that i loved the most was you know, the job that we do is largely isolated uh, and we don't really see that many people. The job of working with a company in a musical is that you see everyone and you see them all the time and you end up working in rehearsal for like four to six weeks with a company of 25, 30 people, performers and all the crew and the band and the people who run the theatre and it's a real family thing uh, and everyone gets very close to each other. And it's, you know, it's incredibly enjoyable to be able to be a part of a process that a lot of the time we are uh, the observers of, you know, it's always weird as a composer being asked to go to a rap party because A, we haven't started our job usually and everyone else is relaxing because they finished and they all know each other, you know, and we're sort of, you know, wandering around the, uh, you know, the party thinking like, well, no one knows who I am because I never get to see anyone. Uh, and also I haven't done the job yet. You know, I could ruin this. So it feels awful. So I tend not to go to those things. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I had started on a couple, of, I'd started on a couple of ideas that as, as very often they do with, with a new musical is that they stall. Um, uh, one was a really good idea um, that I was working on with Steve Coogan. Um, but since everything's shut down, then obviously there's a, you know, there's a lot more trepidation and caution at the moment about new work. So, um, but the, the real thing is, is the problem with musicals is finding the right story, finding the story that's worth telling. Um, and that's an endless search, you know, um, and a lot of people writing them, very little shelf space. You think it's easy to make a record you can put it out to everyone simultaneously but if you're going to put a musical on you need to have a theater and in order to have a theater you've got to have someone not in that theater and so you know if you're going down shaftesbury avenue and you're seeing that there might be 10 theaters and they've all got shows in and they're all doing really well then you start thinking oh my word it's like you start wishing failure on other people's work so they can get kicked out of the theater so you can get in it's you know you can wait for years for a theater to become available so it's very, very complicated, but the process is exhilarating. Cool. There, there is one sneaky question that's quickly coming, so I'm going to try and answer, ask it quickly. Uh, Matthew Wood says, The World is Not Enough is my favourite soundtrack of yours. How did you capture the sound of the film? Not sure if that's a quick answer. Um, I mean, you say capture the sound of the film, 
I think I tend to write from sort of character first, you know, and the, the interesting thing about Bond is that he's the character that everyone knows. So you're not going to really shed any new light on him in terms of himself. That's why he's got a James Bond theme. Um, but what else is there in that film? And Michael Apted, uh, God rest his soul, was like brilliant with character. And the Sophie Marceau, Electric King thing, was an unusual thing that happened in that film is that she actually did get one over. She fooled Bond into believing that she was a person who needed his help and his protection. Uh, and he allowed himself to be fooled by her. Uh, and I thought that was an important thing that happened. Um, and so Electra's theme which again was a it, it was it was it was it was fragility, which is what she was basically selling to Bond and to the M uh, was fragility and guilt, uh, and that they she convinced them that they had a duty to protect her because of her father's relationship with um, with M. So everyone's kind of on the hook for it in a way that it shouldn't really be, it shouldn't really happen, uh, and. We can't let the audience get ahead of Bond in a Bond movie. We can't have them knowing something that he doesn't know. Otherwise, he appears dumb because he's behind us. It's like saying behind you. He's always got to know what's going on. He's got to be ahead of the action. The music can't be ahead of him. Uh, and so the important central emotional core of that film is Electra's theme because what it does it allows us to know how he feels about her uh, and in an honest way it allows us to because it's still slightly ambiguous at the end whether or not she meant any, whether he actually meant anything to do or not I suspect not because she tries to torture him and he shoots her in the face at the end but you know we'd like to think that these nuances can exist in Bond films uh, and I think they do. Uh, um, so th the truth of that relationship had to be believable, and that's what I was writing for. Uh, and I think at the core of that was proper honesty. The other sequences, I suppose, the great thing about Pierce's Bond was that he felt like he enjoyed it, and we could vicariously enjoy it alongside him. So when he's in that speedboat thing, that little cue boat at the start of that film, and it's bouncing along the Thames and, you know, everyone's sort of, you know, there's a woman in a the cigar girl in this great big sun seeker, you know, power boat speeding along the Thames, shooting it in machine guns. And he's got these little gadgets in this Q boat that's not finished. He ends up going underwater and adjusting his tires. He goes underwater and comes back out again and he jumps out of the thing and hangs on a balloon. You know, uh, it's like you feel like even though it's dramatic, you still feel like it's fun. You can enjoy it. And it was a brilliant sequence. So for me, when you're writing something, when it's on screen, it's very obvious what's going on. It's like excitement and thrills. Um, and you have something like that, which you can properly enjoy. And then if alongside that you have something like electricity, then all it does is it widens and broadens your canvas and makes it go back into far more sort of dimensional relationship things, which... I think when you can, you should in a Bond movie, you know, like make those moments more intense uh, or more believable. And Michael Apted was brilliant with the actors in terms of making that work, I thought. So, um, but the sound of it, you kind of have to conceptualise that at the start, really. You think, well, what am I going to do this time? And these are decisions you have to make before the start of every film that you do. Is that, what is this film going to sound like? It's a good question because it's important that you know the answer. What is this film sound-wise? Tiger Came to Tea, that's a small, small big band. That's the core of it, small big band. Independence Day, symphonic choral. Uh, uh, changing Lanes, distorted beats, um, ugly strings. You know, the character of the film in music terms, in sound terms. Those are all decisions you have to make right at the start. So they're big calls to make and you have to know why you're doing it because someone's going to ask you. What a brilliant question to end on. Um, so it wasn't a short answer. <laughs> but it was very revealing. 
It was, um, yeah. It's good. Uh, well, that that brings us to an end. So I'll, I'm going to say thank you very much to David Arnold for giving us your time thank, and thank you. uh, your expertise. And thank you, Steve. For no, pleasure. Us. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, for coming. You're and, very, very welcome. And thank you all. And I'll see you again soon. Oh, look, everyone's saying thank you and lovely. It's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Can you send David oh. a copy of these messages? Um, I'm happy to send David a copy of Lovely. all these thank yous. And I just saw Richard out. Overall's name pop up. Who, who, did, who, yes. who was the? Uh, who was well, the uh, I thought uh, I'd get in the tiger who came to tea because I know that you you guys. Yeah, yeah, together. yeah. No, he, yeah, he, <laughs> he edited that, and he was uh, extremely, uh, extremely important in the formation of that as an idea, uh, and and in the success of that thing working. He was uh, between, I'd say, between him and and. Um, the director um you know very very big part of why that film worked i'd say okay well we'll have to get we'll have to get richard on that can be steve's next uh, masterclass <laughs> he's still um, listening on this i know he is <laughs> you love the compliments i'm sure um anyway thank you everyone it's well deserved uh, we'll no. say goodbye thank you ever so much david i really okay. appreciate it tonight it was, all right yeah no worries okay see you soon dunks